let's get up a, a, a good friend of mine, Dr. Dorio, because he's going to talk to us about putting grandma in a nursing home. And I especially like this because he didn't talk about putting grandpa in a, in a nursing home. <laughs> And is that because grandpas are more ornery? Come on up here and talk to us. I'll get your presentation up. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, while Alan's getting that up, uh, you know, we uh, have a radio show, and I do the radio show on Wednesdays. And I was telling uh, uh, on the show today, I talked about my mother who's 97 and when she was 92 she was still driving and uh, it scared us a little bit but we had we felt we had a remedy by going under the hood and taking the battery out <laughs> and we did that several times but of course uh, uh, she got wise to us and AAA came and put the battery back in so uh, after the the second time, she got a little frustrated and said, and my brother, who was taking the battery out, he, uh, he went to her car, her garage, to take the battery out the third time. And what happened instead was she had hooked up an alarm uh, on the car. Uh, but it was, it was three, 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 key, three things you had to do simul almost simultaneously, one after the other within a certain number of seconds to stop the alarm from going off. And of course, my brother didn't know how to stop it. So that happened several times. But you know, we got together later, um, and we were talking about, to our mom about, please don't drive anymore. And she, uh, she just she looked at us and, and said, in a kind of a sly way, how are you going to stop me? So, you know, th this is a part of our life. It's independence when we attempt to, you know, be out there still and, and be a part. We did eventually get, uh, she gave, her car was a 1972 Malibu. And it had only 62,000 miles on it. And it was in pristine condition. And so my cousin who collects cars uh, asked his aunt, my mom, uh, if uh, uh, he could buy it from her, and he said, "I'll just give it to you." And at, at 92 years old, she stopped. She stopped driving. So, so it was, you know, a safe way of getting through life. And now we drive her around. She does live up here in Santa Clarita now, uh, at least for a while. And uh, uh, but this is this is a grandma, and this is you know she is not in a nursing home, and that's what this talk is about putting grandma in a nursing home. And I'd like to thank uh, the Canyon Country Advisory Committee. Uh, I apologize for the uh, miswriting. Uh, but I want to, uh, you know, this to be an educational uh, lecture that does also apply to grandpas, too. <laughs> so just background for those who don't uh, who don't know me, I've been here in Santa Clarita for 32 years. And actually, in looking around, I've grown up with uh, a lot of you here. And you know, I'm just so thankful the influence that so many of you have had, not just on my medical practice, but um, also in, in fighting for the rights of older adults here in Santa Clarita. We have, uh, it has not been an easy task, uh, but certainly, uh, to be honest with you, I think as we look at each other, and we have aged a little bit, uh, it has been fun, uh, like my mom hooking up her car with the alarm. It's, it's fun to sometimes do these things to, to not the wart, but to move all of us forward. So I also uh, do house calls here in Santa Clarita, and I've been uh, doing them uh, 32 years as well, and that has taught me and given me a lot of information about how our older adults live. I'm on the advisory council for the Santa Clarita Senior Center, and Alan uh, is our vice president, and uh, Keith uh, is our president. So we are well represented uh, here today, and. As well, I'm on the COC uh, SCV 
uh, Suicide Prevention and Postvention and Wellness uh, Committee. Uh, I've been on the uh, the uh, staff at Henry Mayo, and I was the chairman of the Department of Medicine for three years as well. Um, I've been elected uh, this year to the uh, state assembly, but in a different way. For it's, it's for the California Senior Legislature, and uh, the most recently in July, I took over the reins of the Los Angeles County Commission uh, for Older Adults, and I am the uh, uh, president right now for uh, one year, and I you know, might uh, seek second term, but I have to first see how this first term is, because it's not, an, for sure, it's not an easy task. Uh, I do a lot of media work, uh, as Alan does, uh, and uh, I have a blog uh, that I've been, uh, uh, started something that's a blog uh, called Doctor's Diary, and uh, that's been pretty successful for me, because it uh, goes out to about 25,000 readers now. Uh, and I think it's probably a little bit more as that uh, there's a network that sends it out as well. Uh, so, you know, I've had fun. I don't have a whole lot of time, so I, ca I call it a snippet. So I try to keep it under 200 words. And at some point, I even talked about it here at uh, one of our meetings uh, also. I'm a member of the Association of Healthcare Journalists. And as I mentioned, I do have a radio show called The Senior Hour that I co-host with Barbara Cochran, are you here today, Barbara? I don't see you. Uh, uh, and I've been doing that for about 15 years. Uh, I do contribute to the uh, uh, Santa Clarita Gazette, and I have contributed uh, to the Signal as well, having a column there, Profiles in Medicine. And I had a uh, television uh, show with Leon Warden uh, at SCV uh, uh, TV. Uh, so here's the scenario. The scenario is, as you can see, uh, grandma becomes ill or falls. She goes to the hospital, uh, which hospitals now uh, are triage centers. They funnel patients in and out uh, with only partial treatment. Uh, and then uh, grandma's home is not set up uh, uh, to care for a, rec a recuperating uh, older senior. And she's not able to physically live on her own. Uh, and while she's still ill. So what happens? She gets sent to a nursing home. And you might be able to see this. It says the results of, the results of your test were negative, get lost. <laughs> so just understand that nursing homes are convalescent homes. Uh, and it's nicely been rebranded uh, for everyone uh, into skilled nursing facilities or SNFs uh, and rehab centers. But just remember, it's all the same. Uh, it's uh, nothing has changed. They are nursing homes. Um, what can patients do to avoid uh, nursing homes? Uh, well, you don't get ill, and of course, that's not an easy task. But you don't fall. You eat healthy. Uh, you exercise routinely. Uh, you, you see your doctor regularly. You make sure you're taking your medications appropriately. Uh, you stay mentally healthy, and you go to the senior center and you participate. So, um, but you know, you should always anticipate that you will get ill and you will have to go to uh, into a hospital setting. So, uh, the important part we have all now learned. Uh, is that we have to have our paperwork in place. If the paramedics come to your home, paperwork, they want to see paperwork. They want to know uh, who you are, uh, what your health problems are, but they want to know what you want them to do. And most of the time they will transport you. Sometimes uh, there's an issue and there's a um, directive that says do not transport and they won't transport. So, but you want to be able to have that paperwork in place. Those are the advanced directives, the durable power of attorney for health care and uh, for medical decision making. You want a list of your medicines, uh, the DNR status, which is do not resuscitate, uh, which is a uh, pulse, uh, which is a physician um, orders for life sustaining treatment. Uh, you need to have a discussion with your family. That's so important. Family and friends as well as, about, as to what your wishes are uh, for your end of life care. Uh, and you want to make sure that you've appointed someone uh, 
to be in charge of your finances. Uh, if you are able to, you should consider uh, the possibility of having an elder law uh, attorney look into uh, your paperwork to make sure everything is in place uh, because um, sometimes when you go on the internet you can get the appropriate uh, um, uh, papers but sometimes it's, uh, there's some tweaking so you have to be real careful in what it says because this is your loved one or your, your own life and one little word here and there can be misinterpreted and if indeed that happens you could go in a direction that you uh, did not anticipate. Um, and we do, you can go to the senior center to get help as well. Uh, but the most important thing we always talk about is that you should have an advocate. Uh, if you are in the hospital, remember you're ill. Uh, you might not be able to even say what your wishes are. Uh, you might not uh, be awake and conscious to be able to tell those around you, especially the doctors and nurses, uh, what your needs are. Uh, so it's always good to have somebody at bedside uh, and many at bedside if you can to assure that uh, your, your wishes, the, the things that you've wanted and always wanted, you've conveyed to your family and friends are, are followed through uh, while you're in the acute care setting of a hospital. So when you go into a hospital, you, you as a older adult, as a senior, you are targeted. And you're targeted now for financial reasons. If you are on Medicare, if you are on Medi-Cal, if you are on an HMO, um, the problems related uh, to the finances uh, that they uh, look at, uh, they want you in and out. And as I said earlier, you are funneled in, you are funneled out. And there's just rules that they are following now that uh, to a certain degree are, are good financial things that they need to do, but some of the things they do are reprehensible. You should be worried if your loved one is an older adult or, or has been hospitalized for a prolonged period. Uh, uh, if you don't know your doctor or uh, your doctors are contracted by the hospital or an organization and those doctors do not communicate well. And more frequently, uh, I can probably get a uh, hand raising here uh, that uh, in asking the question, uh, how much time do you get to really talk with your doctor? How much time do they, do they really uh, get to know you? In this day and age, it's, not, it's happening less and less, unfortunately. Uh, and you know, my, my profession has changed markedly uh, over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, hospital tactics you should be aware of. Uh, if doctors or nurses uh, or hospital staff urge you to change uh, your documents, your DNR, do not resuscitate status, that is a constant and so prevalent uh, now you you want you've wanted and you're you've told your family you want certain things uh, but they will approach you uh, and it happens they come into the your room into the hallways and they're constantly do that doing this not just at our hospital it's all over the place don't think for one second that that uh, uh, we're uh, we, we have a hospital that's doing it every hospital everywhere is doing this around the United States. And it's, uh, it'll, it could easily be another lecture uh, about how uh, hospitals uh, in the 1990s uh, devised ways of making money, devised ways of uh, affecting health, devised ways of saving money to a certain degree, but most importantly, to devise ways to make their profit, and that's uh, what they've been doing. Um, excuse me for a second. Um, also, you need to be aware if there's uh, pressure placed on you or your family members about pa placing the patient on hospice or comfort care, I've written extensively about this. Uh, you can refer to my blog if you like. Uh, there are many other people, though, who are writing about this also. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, unfortunately, we will look back at this time 
in medical history and maybe in uh, this time of our country and find that um, what they're doing now with hospice care and how they're doing it uh, is assaulting the American people, assaulting the greatest generation, and will assault the baby boom generation. If they tell you your loved one is suffering, uncomfortable, and of course, if you're in a hospital setting, you are uncomfortable. You know, there's, you're just not gonna come in to the hospital and say, put an IV in me, make me better, you know, and turn the TV on, let me watch some soaps. That doesn't, that does not happen. You are ill, you are sick, uh, you're trying to recover, your body sometimes mutes things and puts things to rest so that you can try to recuperate. So, you know, you are gonna be, and you're gonna see that your loved ones are uncomfortable, that's, that's a give me, but sometimes they try to use that uh, to convince you that, you know, you need to change the direction of your loved one. Uh, they tell you there's no hope, uh, that care is futile, there's no quality of life, or they will never get back to normal. And the worst part is, the next bullet point, they, you need to worry if they make these statements to you in the first 48 hours. Because I know I've been in the hospital setting for 40 years, and I know, you know, when I did trauma, I'll tell you, the patients will come in and you have to save their life you have to do the right things immediately. But once you get through the door and you are stable and we get you to the floor, sometimes the process is to try to figure out what's wrong with you and how we are gonna treat you. Uh, it doesn't tell you how long you're gonna live and what your prognosis is gonna be. But some of the doctors, nurses, hospitals are saying, you're done within 48 hours, sometimes within 24 hours of being admitted to the hospital. That doesn't work, but people are playing God now, and doctors are doing this day in and day out, and I, I do not believe in, this, in the process that is taking place, uh, and we need to change that. Um, they might attempt to take away your legal rights to make decisions for your loved ones. Uh, I, there's an article, one of my articles uh, talks about the laws in the state of California, they're not, what, they're not what you think. They're not what you think. Uh, you would think that the person in line who makes decisions is going to be spouse, and it's going to be children, it's going to be, and work its way down uh, the relations uh, course. It's not like that in the state of California. Uh, you need to look that up uh, because that is a threat. And I tell you, it's not, I've seen an attempt to use that uh, in the past, uh, but I will tell you that soon uh, some of these, these business people are, are gonna start using that much more frequently against us and they're gonna be taking away people's rights and they're not gonna know legally how they're gonna handle that situation because the law says this and they can these with hospital lawyers they can they can take your rights away immediately and not allow you to make decisions for your loved one uh, and of course if you have somebody who's on life support they might attempt to urge you to abandon that and move forward with hospice or end-of-life care so there are ways of fighting back. Uh, you need to demand time to make decisions. It's unfortunate that you know, somebody who's ill, who's in an ICU setting, the doctors, nurses, people come in, uh, discharge planners or whoever they are, case managers, they come in and they'll say, uh, your, your loved one has this problem. And they will expect you to make a decision immediately, unfortunately. And, and you have to be able to say, talk to the hand, I want the time. Talk to the hand, I want to talk to my family, and I want to re review with everybody how our loved one wants us to, to move forward. Uh, so you, you demand the time, you do not let them take that time away from you. Uh, you do not want to make uh, hasty or spontaneous decisions because you know in the long run, you might regret it. So 
demand that you be given time to make those decisions. Uh, you have to have a family discussion. If you have family, they're there. Uh, you round everybody up. Uh, you try not to leave people out. Uh, once again, guilt plays a role in some of that. Uh, but uh, you, you want everybody to be able to give their input if, if possible. Uh, you get an outside, unbiased second opinion uh, if, you, if you can. Uh, sometimes they'll bring in a second opinion, but they'll be biased. So you have to be aware that some of these organizations, everybody works together. Uh, they're in lockstep with each other, so they're going to make the same decision. So it's not an honest second opinion. Um, you, can, you can request a meeting of the Ethics Committee. I chaired that for several years, uh, and I saw some things that were atrocious that people were doing. Uh, and, but you can ask for the ethics committee and come in uh, as a family or as an individual to, uh, if someone, a doctor, a organization, an HMO is saying this needs to be done, you can fight that through the ethics committee. Um, there are ways of reporting the hospital to oversight uh, agencies. And there are several of them, uh, including the Joint Commission, Health Department, Ombudsman, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, as most of you and I look out, you know that I did a lot of that. And I know that despite the fact these are agencies that have oversight over hospitals, nothing was done. Slap on the hand, nothing was done. We need to strengthen our ability to, for them to be able to act and uh, stop some of the things that are going on. But, you know, at least if you do something, you know, and I can tell you some of the things, the reports that I made, um, they even said it closed down our hospital. But we could not, I could not allow in good conscience what some of the things that were being done, and they, these agencies came in and helped clarify the things that were going on so that it would not happen again. Um, plus, in addition, when you are a Medicare patient, um, you have, if, if they're, you're being told you have to be discharged or your loved one has to be discharged, you can appeal that. And that is a process you have to, they give you sheets of paper and it says exactly what you need to do, but you have to do it. There is a phone call to make. It stops the discharge immediately if you feel your loved one is going into an unsafe situation. Uh, and it starts a process of somebody looking at the chart and making a decision. I've had many patients who um, have done that. Uh, and they've done it successfully. I've had many that have done that and have not, it has not been successful. Uh, so it just depends on who the evaluator is, who the doctor, um, and usually it's a doctor at the other end of the phone. Uh, but I have been successful in uh, getting uh, discharges ap appealed successfully. So. It's not an easy task, but it's always worthwhile. The, there is a general rule about the hospital. It's a four-day stay. Uh, that's what I call it. Uh, but, but understand that um, uh, this is, I believe, all around the country. I talk to my colleagues in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And you know, I'll tell you that uh, it's going on everywhere. And they want you in the hospital and out in four days. I'm, you know, I, and many patients can be out in four days. This Emergency. is a quick yes. announcement. Somebody just hit the fire hydrant on the street and the whole parking lot is getting flooded. If there's somebody wants to check on their car. So should we come back up? All right. Okay, we're gonna restart again. And uh, I see, I notice a few people have been washed away. <laughs> so, but it, 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 it's okay, yeah, hopefully. 
So uh, just going back to what we were talking about, the, the hospital four-day rule, you know, this, is, uh, this has been going on for quite a few years now. Uh, and, you know, j just easily judge it. The, statistically, if we were to look at uh, what these hospitals have done, uh, they, by cutting down the days, and there's a financial interest in this as well, uh, and that's why they do it. Uh, how they're getting paid by Medicare and, and Medi-Cal, et cetera. So it's, sometimes you can understand it, because the system is, is, you know, from one side to the other, you know, the hospitals have gone bankrupt, ours did. And so we have to try to preserve our hospitals in this country. That's how we will survive. But, you know, we can't preserve hospitals that are also not allowing us to survive. So the important part right now is to just understand that these, these problems are going on and to be aware of it. And by, by being able to, to act back on it, is so important that you get that little bit of education uh, so that your loved one is not uh, pushed around when they get into a hospital setting. So when you get into the hospital, you'll be told uh, constantly they're telling you you don't meet the criteria anymore. And I've looked at the criteria, the several criteria that hospitals use, uh, but it's not criteria, you know, they'll say it's evidence-based, but it's not criteria that fits uh, the cause, especially for older adults who obviously take a lot longer to heal. Um, they'll tell you that Medicare is not going to pay your hospital bill anymore and that you'll have to pay it. And of course, that is not true. In most cases, 99%, it is not true, but they'll use that to ply your mind so that you start thinking and saying, I can't afford a hospital bill. And they'll, you know, hope, they're hoping that you walk away or move your, pay, your loved one out. Uh, and of course, they're telling you, you know, take grandma or grandpa to a nursing home because uh, this is a, a, a threat that they are going to sustain because they don't have any other options. Uh, they're going to tell you that care is futile uh, and that you should go on palliative uh, hospice or comfort care and understand they're going to say, well, bring the palliative care team in. But to them, there's a big difference in defining what palliative care and hospice care is. And that could take up a whole nother lecture. And, but if you look at my uh, blog site, uh, I have attempted and I think successfully defined what those differences are. But in a hospital setting, when they say, uh, we want the palliative care team to come on board, palliative care is great. The idea, it's a super idea. But the problem is the hospitals use it and say, you're on palliative care and now we're putting you on hospice immediately. And hospice is totally different because it is end of life care. And you will see that constantly, especially in an ICU setting when your loved ones are really ill. And of course you don't know, and doctors and everybody else don't know the direction your loved one is gonna go, but you know, they're, they're kind of predicting or trying to predict to you so that you make hasty decisions and move them out onto palliative and hospice care. Um, remember that when you're in a hospital setting, being the patient, uh, you're sometimes being asked to make decisions, and you're not well enough, sometimes physically and mentally, to be able to make those decisions. So having an advocate, like we mentioned before, having that advocate there is so important to make sure that uh, you get the information reliably, uh, but also you're able to uh, digest that and move it forward into a positive uh, uh, decision for, for yourself or your loved one. Uh, before your discharge or your loved one is discharged from the hospital, there are things that you need to do. Uh, readmissions to hospitals big time now. Think about it, a four day stay, you're in, you're out. Sometimes patients are out and the wrong diagnosis is made. Many times the patients leave the hospital and they don't even know what their diagnosis was. It wasn't communicated to them. 
But if you're in a hospital setting, if you are in a hospital setting, uh, you, the family and you're being told your loved one needs to go to a nursing home or rehab center, whatever it is, you should be looking at those facilities. Uh, and we have one in Santa Clarita, uh, we have many in the valley, but you should make a trip and maybe even beforehand with the thought that to evaluate and make sure you uh, know what the abilities they have to take care of any patient. Uh, some of them are very marginal uh, and some of them are very good, uh, but some are very marginal uh, in terms of giving appropriate care uh, to our senior patients. Um, Many a time, whether you're going to uh, convalescence or whether you're going home, uh, you will get a home health agency. And once again, that's not easy. You have to rely on your doctor uh, to allow, to give you the information uh, that says that they're gonna do adequate care. Because sometimes you, you don't know. Sometimes these companies are fly-by-nights and they don't have the nursing staff or the physical therapy staff to be able to get out to your home to be able to take care of yourself or your loved one. Um, you, you have to make sure there's something called durable medical equipment for like wheelchairs, walkers, uh, hospital beds, uh, Hoya lifts. Uh, these are all known as durable medical equipment and you have to make sure that those are delivered an appropriate time because you know one of my patients uh, recently was discharged from the hospital and we ordered a Hoya lift uh, for him which allows him to be transferred from his bed into a wheelchair onto the toilet uh, but they the company came and it was one of those windy Santa Clarita days he the the Hoya lift was put on uh, the porch uh, and the the Hoya lift, and by the way, it was the wrong porch. It was one next door, but it was blown down the driveway into the street and over. And these Hoya lifts weigh 50 to 70 pounds, uh, but these are the, you want this equipment delivered because if you don't have it and you're sitting and waiting for a hospital bed, your loved one is you know out of luck, and they're going to be it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, IV care at home, intravenous care at home with antibiotics, it's big time now. Uh, one of my patients uh, just recently, uh, the husband was discharged and he was there for four days. Uh, he had an infection, pretty significant, but he had uh, just one antibiotic to give. Uh, arrangements, all the arrangements were made. The attending doctor uh, called the company up, said there's everything ready. The wife called the uh, discharge planner, uh, the case manager, uh, and the doctor, and they all said, everybody said, it's, it's, everything is cool. We've got everything in place. Patient gets home, just 11 o'clock in the morning, at four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the patient is now at home, discharged from the hospital, and the Wife is saying, where are the antibiotics? They're not here yet. Calls the, calls, makes like four phone calls within an hour, and then the discharge planner says, oh, we have a little problem. And the problem was uh, the, there's a cost to the antibiotic. And uh, the uh, wife said, how much is the cost? And uh, she said, $400. And, you know, she had to think about it, think about it, and then she realized, is that for the whole time or is that per, per day? Per day. For 15 days, $400. Now the patient is at home. And, of course, the patient bounced back into the hospital. When I saw the patient on a house call, uh, had not had an antibiotic for 48 hours uh, because of this, this problem, had not had an antibiotic. The cost at that point was becoming a bigger problem, but when I went over, I had to send him back to the hospital because he became sick again. So the, these have to be arranged, but there's in such haste get, to get patients out of the hospital, they're being readmitted uh, and you know, sometimes, not just readmitted, 
but the patient is sicker. And that is not what should happen in our country. And this has to, has to make all of us fearful for when we're in the hospital, our loved ones are in the hospital, uh, it has to make us fearful that these things are going on in every community around the United States. There are horror stories. Uh, there are prescriptions uh, that need to be filled and they have to be called in. Sometimes that becomes a problem. Uh, and all of this needs to be discussed with the attending doctor. There are hospitalists uh, and they're on 12, off 12. So sometimes you get a new person that's come on and sometimes you know, they don't know your loved one. You know, this, this is very problematic how we are dealing with um, our hospitalized patients. Just to bring up uh, a point that you're all aware of, the Transitional Care Unit, TCU, we had one here in Santa Clarita at our hospital. This uh, is from uh, the signal. It was from July 25th, uh, just a month ago. And this is the, they're celebrating 100 years uh, and they're posting, I think, uh, some of their bigger headlines. And this was one of them. This was when Robin and I and others in this community, some of you out here, who, who uh, picketed the hospital five months in a row to sustain our transitional care unit. The transitional care unit served as a stepping stone where our older adults could go to and recuperate, get better, and then go home. So we found out that they were closing it. They were closing from one week to the next. Uh, the protests that we made uh, allowed the transitional care unit to stay open another um, 19 months, but eventually it was closed. And you know, if we still had this, I will tell you, I would have no gripes about our hospital or any hospital that would put a transitional care unit together because I know that uh, having that would make a huge difference for our patients being able to eventually get home and survive. So what solutions for grandma does the future hold? And I don't think you can read it, and I might not be able to read it either, but it's a, uh, she's reading his palm. In the background is a mushroom cloud, and it says, that's odd, I don't see anything in your future, nothing. Uh, and not that grandma doesn't have something in the future, we have to be the ones that provide that future. So as mentioned before, I'm the president of the Los Angeles County Commission for Older Adults. I was elected president and started my term on July the 1st. And our mission, as you can read, is to advocate and advise and make suggestions and recommendations uh, to the uh, Board of Supervisors. This commission is the largest commission in terms of number. This commission also, by age, is the oldest commission. Uh, so we've been around for a while. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great place to, uh, to be a part of. The individuals who are on this commission are committed to assuring that those, those older adults in Los Angeles County are getting the appropriate care across the board. But this year we have uh, established uh, two goals uh, for, this, for this commission. Uh, and uh, one is uh, there is uh, something called age-friendly communities and we are going to, we, uh, and that this is, this is international, I'll be talking about this in a minute, uh, but we want to focus on that and try to, to increase the number of these communities in Los Angeles County. And the second thing is to age in place, like I was talking about before, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more about some of the things I've put in my articles that help uh, maybe bring to terms how we are going to be able to do that. Um, the the uh, concept of age-friendly communities started mainly because the, uh, they're realizing, in, realizing that the older population around the world is increasing. And we know in, I think in the state, this state by 2030, 
uh, we will, I think it's about 20 to 25, 20 percent of the California population will be, will be seniors. Uh, and so uh, around the world, they have put together a, a network to be able to, to, for everybody to exchange ideas so that whether you're in uh, Canada or Europe or Australia, we'll be able to share ideas with around the world with how we are helping uh, older adults in our community to make your community better. Uh, and there are eight domains or eight areas, and you can read those. Uh, and of course, you know, the big things are transportation and housing is huge, but the list goes on to eight, and we, we have to be focusing on that. Uh, there are only five cities in Los Angeles County that are designated age-friendly communities, five. And it, uh, this all started in 2005. Uh, so this has been going on for almost 15 years, and we have five. Uh, and there, if you look at your, um, uh, the internet, you'll see there are, they're spotted around the country. Uh, the, it, the city of Santa Clarita has, is the sixth that has come through and decided that they are going to be an age-friendly community and get into the network. The network is run by nationally by AARP, but this, our city has decided they are going to do this. And uh, I had, when I first got on the commission a year ago, I had uh, gone to meetings and uh, uh, found, talked about these issues, about these communities, and decided that I wanted to see how our city would respond to it. I talked to Marsha McLean, Mayor Marsha McLean, and she said, let's bring it to, to Ken Striplin. And we did, so I met with him and Jared and the staff and brought in a spokesperson to discuss uh, age-friendly communities and voila. It took nine months, but of course, we're really careful, Alan, you know, we're careful with our budget. And the cost for doing age-friendly communities is, thank goodness, not that much. But this is going to be uh, brought out, uh, hopefully, in the next, uh, in September or October. Uh, and my hope is that you'll all take a look at it and you'll all move forward with this and speak positively of it, because it will make huge changes on how we live here in Santa Clarita. Because of that, though, um, the the LACOA, the uh, commission that I'm president of, uh, we have decided that we are going to target other cities in LA County as well. Since there are only five, our goal has been to increase the uh, number of cities uh, from five to 10. So at our executive board meeting on Monday, uh, we uh, have designated several other cities uh, including in District 1, El Monte, uh, another in our district, uh, South Pasadena, uh, and I think Santa Monica was shown to, oh, and Inglewood. And since I grew up in District 2, uh, in the Inglewood area, uh, I have formed a committee to, to meet in, at the Inglewood Senior Center and we will be discussing how we are going to organize the group to look at uh, older adults in the city that will have the Chargers, will have the Rams, and will have the Olympics. And, but the seniors there need to be a part of that, and they want to be, uh, but this hasn't, it, nobody has done this. So this, this, our LACOA commission will be moving forward in this direction over this next year to see if we can possibly get Inglewood signed up as well like we did with Santa Clarita. Um, now, aging in place, and aging in place, I've written about on the blog, my blog, and you can read about it, but uh, if you, you can see, uh, there are many things that uh, we can achieve, uh, especially in terms of housing, to try to assure that seniors can stay in their homes. 
And some of it is physical where we have to talk to uh, the uh, planning commission, we have to talk to developers, uh, we have to see if they want to be able to designate uh, senior uh, friendly homes so that uh, we can, we're can we able to uh, stay in our homes for much longer and hopefully stay in our homes the rest of our lives. But these are some of the suggestions, a single story, uh, minimal steps inside and outside, uh, ramped adaptable, uh, uh, wheelchair compatible, wide indoors, wide in hallways. Uh, there's so many things that and I, I'm already seeing it in our community. I'm already seeing many um, families, uh, they have built roll-in showers for their loved ones. Who does that? But it's happening here. There are some model homes here in Santa Clarita for older adults and disabled that are perfect examples of what we need to lead to for our older adult population. So we have to be the ones who come up with these ideas. We have to be the ones who work within uh, the uh, communities of, of aging. And we have to be the ones that not only think of these ideas, but we have to be able to be the ones that implement these ideas. Um, we can get work on getting community support. You just remember, you know, I, I believe that this city has done a great job in terms of where we live. It's been, you know, awesome. We've gone, Alan has gone, and many of you here have gone to city council to say, hey, there's a problem here. And, you know, many times they have listened. And I'm, and sometimes they haven't. But, I, and I'm okay with that. But fiscally, they have figured out a way for us to be in a position where many cities are not. So I'm pretty thankful that uh, we have people who are out there, who are involved, who are doing a great job for us in the community. So we talk about community and government support, property tax abatement, communal living. You already know uh, that the Senior Center and Robin Clow and several other people, Mary Jane, others who are working toward uh, bringing uh, senior housing to uh, especially women who might potentially become homeless, uh, bringing that forward. These are all, you know, in, in terms of legally looking at it, financially looking at these uh, possibilities, we are doing that and we're doing it well from these ideas here in Santa Clarita. So, you know, I talked about autonomous cars because uh, I'm so anxious and waiting for uh, these computer cars to come. I, Hopefully they'll be safe, uh, but you know I think that will allow all of us to remain independent. And for my mom, she would not have to uh, uh, put alarms on her car anymore. She will be able to either do Lyft, which we have already, uh, or Uber, uh, but she might be able to have an autonomous car to be able to still get around the grocery store, to church, to all the places that she's always wanted to go. And of course, we, we should not uh, still uh, neglect the idea of having a transitional care unit. Uh, if we can somehow figure out a financial way to do that, that would be great uh, and bring that back to our community. Uh, we, like I said, we only have one nursing home, but that nursing home um, you know, is one. And if we had a transitional care unit, we can use that transitional care unit to get people uh, back in their homes so they can age in place. Uh, how will it be funded? I already know that there's huge amounts of fraud and waste uh, in, in, we know it in government, but it's huge in terms of uh, Medicare and Medi-Cal. We need to rectify that. Will government allow us to do that? I don't know, but you all know that uh, I write about putting people in jail if they violate the law, and we need to start doing that. So, any questions? Judy. And if you, uh, can't, re if you can't read this, it says, uh, it's, uh, I think, a gran grandson and his grandmother. 
I'll give it to you straight, Grandma. You're not reaching your full potential. Um, I attended Congresswoman Hill's town hall at Canyon High School, and the Red Cross lady who gave the presentation, I'm hoping to get her out here, uh, the handouts came in a plastic freezer bag, and all of the documents she spoke at, of at the beginning of your presentation, she recommends go in the freezer bag and you put it in the back of your freezer because right. that's where first responders are going to look mm -hmm. for your DNR and all that good kind of stuff, again, that you mentioned at the first of your presentation. Mm -hmm. Two, you need to, I think, talk to the Skyline Ranch folks if you haven't. It's off Plum Canyon. It's the new road from Plum to Sierra Highway. Oh, okay. We had an outstanding presentation by the president of Party, and they are going to be building a 300 unit single story senior community gated and it's a hop skip and the jump from the senior center but you might want to chat with them on the configuration of those 300 single story homes i think that alan would be able to tell us better on that judy because i would like to see that we implement in santa clarita through the planning commission the idea of when developers are are going to build senior communities, it has to be well defined. You know, going back to what we talked about uh, earlier, uh, you know, about single story and things like that, I think that needs to be put in the law to allow people to say we're a senior community. Mm -hmm. And then going back to the, um, the container, the container, uh, we re my brother is a physician also, in Santa Clarita, and he and I recommended to uh, LA County Fire that it be put on the um, back of the front door or on the front of the refrigerator. Yeah. And so, and inside the refrigerator is fine as well, uh, but the paramedics know now to where they're gonna be looking for the most part for most of the people. And I do wanna get Robin and Mary Jane and the third person out to, uh, the committee here to give a presentation on what they're doing with the senior women's oh, housing great. thing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that you guys are doing. Well, let's give that for a big hand. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Uh, there is one thing that uh, I didn't hear in the presentation, so maybe uh, Dr. Dorio can, uh, can help us out with this. What I didn't hear, Doc, was more paramedic teams more paramedic teams here in the valley. Yeah, we're growing. Well, besides growing, they're very sparse here in the valley, and it, it's been a concern that a lot of people have had for a long time, and um, I think it's something that we need to really look at. Look